Well, day everybody, we've come to lecture nine in St John's Gospel. We've reached the last speech, the farewell speech of Jesus at the Last Supper. Today we do the first section, chapters 14 and 15. Next week we'll do chapters 16 and 17, the second section. So we're looking at today the Lord's most significant last words that he wants to leave impregnated in our minds and hearts. He knows he's living his final hour. So what he now says is like his last will and testament that he wants us to read after he's gone and really absorb it. These are key directives, if you like, for each and every Christian community. The Lord's pouring his heart out to us all, how he wants us to live. So I'd like to look firstly at the whole nature of a farewell speech, or as some say, the last discourse. Then I'd like to look at chapter 14. And then thirdly, I'd like to look at chapter 15, the first part of it, all about the vine and the branches. And then finally, midway through chapter 15 to the early part of chapter 16, which looks at another aspect, and that is the, the challenges, the persecutions that are going to happen to us. So, they're the four things. Now, the first one we said was the last discourse or the farewell speech of Jesus. Now what's all that about? What's the, what's the literary genre, if you like? Now all through the book of Signs, chapters 1 to 12, John would work like this. He'd give us a story about a special sign and then he'd follow it with a speech. So if you think of the story of the multiplication of the loaves and fish, then it was followed by the narrative of Jesus' bread of life. Think again of the man born blind. That's the story he gives us. That's followed by the discourse on Jesus as light of the world. Now, once we come to this farewell speech, this last discourse, it's going to be explaining the significance of the greatest of Jesus' signs, his death on the cross, his hour of glorification, his return to the Father. However, this is not just a sign anymore, but it's actually entering into glory. And as Raymond Brown puts it, rather powerfully I think, the last discourse partakes of the glory of the hour and surpasses in nobility and majesty even the most solemn discourses of his ministry. The latter were often directed to hostile audiences like the Jews, Jewish authorities we understand and was delivered against a background of rejection by the world. But in the last discourse, Jesus speaks to his own, for whom he is willing to lay down his life. So intense is his love. The Jesus who speaks here transcends time and space. He is a risen Jesus, who is already on the way to the Father. And his concern is that we shall not abandon those who believe in him, but must remain in the world. Although he speaks at the Last Supper, he's really speaking to us from heaven. And although those who hear him are his disciples, his words are directed to Christians of all time. St. John, in the last discourse, is using a very common technique. 
in weaving a lot of continuous different aspects into a narrative that's rather whole and clear about Jesus' departure and how they're going to live. Jacob gave a farewell speech too and a blessing when he was about to die in Genesis chapter 49. Joshua did the same. King David did the same. But perhaps the most significant of all farewell speeches that we have in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, is the farewell speech of Moses. And the whole of the book of Deuteronomy is presented as the farewell speech of Moses. And just as the words of Moses in Deuteronomy are addressed beyond the narrative to later readers of the book, so the words of Jesus move beyond the Last Supper to all of his disciples who will ever read his words until, of course, the end of time. Again, Raymond Brown would say, put it like this, The last discourse is Jesus' last testament. It's meant to be read after he's left the earth. Yet it isn't like other testaments, which are the recorded words of men who are dead and can speak no more. For whatever they may, there may be of the ipsissima verba, you know, the ipsissima, the very, very words that Jesus actually did say, that's what that's, that technical phrase means, ipsissima verba, whatever there was that he actually did say, has been transformed in the light of the resurrection and through the coming of the paraclete into a, a living discourse delivered not by a dead man but by one who has life to all readers of the gospel. And that's why we approach these chapters sort of in a very prayerful, reflective way. They are, as Michael Fallon suggests, some of the deepest homilies of the beloved disciple. Or, as Raymond Brown puts it, one of the greatest compositions of religious literature. The one who speaks here speaks as no one has ever spoken. Some people suggest that the last discourse is the Johannine version of what we know in the Synoptic Gospels as the eschatological discourse. Great word, isn't it? The eschaton is the last things. What's going to happen at the end of the world sort of stuff? Which speaks, of course, about the future, about persecutions, and about the necessity to keep watch, to keep vigil. Because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you don't expect, and so on. We will see today that the last section we're going to look at, the fourth section, has quite a few eschatological or end time themes. So there's truth in that. Now just for a moment now, before we go into the first section of the last discourse, how would we divide the last discourse? And this is pretty significant. Everybody would agree that chapter 14 was, was the original last discourse. It contains it all. Then a significant number of people would say that chapter 15, 16 and 17, those chapters, are additions by a later editor from another strand of, of the community's thinking. The material isn't inferior to chapter 14 in any way. In fact, chapter 17, the priestly prayer, is quite magnificent. So we take it all as the revelation of, of God to us. Now, so chapter 14 is, uh, is one division. Then the first...